this Ford console has not turned a wheel for 12 years. Today, its owner, John Wilkinson, is going to run it on the private roads of a country estate. We thought it was a very neat, clean-lined motor. When we ordered this car, I think it must have been in production some four and a half years because it was actually brought out in 1950. The console's American styling influenced the look of all British cars. We ordered the car in uh, July of uh, 1955 and we were told that delivery would be early in the new year of 56. With the waiting time for a new car of about nine months, the Wilkinsons were confident about finding the 788 pounds for theirs, but then they heard it had turned up early. It said, we are pleased to inform you that your new Ford console has arrived. Oh dear, real panic stations then. But we managed it. And it says, call and see us as soon as possible to arrange delivery. We went there and there it was, in the edge of the showroom there. And, uh, well, I wanted to sleep in it for the first few nights. <laughs> it was so marvellous. You know, the room, heater, radio. Unbelievable. And it became part of the family. It wasn't just comfort that made the console different. Up until now, most British cars looked like this. Sit up and beg, with separate wings, and built on a heavy steel chassis. The console, its sculpted shape derived from the American Ford Tudor, had no chassis, but rather derived its strength from the body. This modernity nearly put John Wilkinson off. To buy a car without a chassis, knowing what I thought I knew about cars at the time, was quite a difficult decision because eventually the plan was to tow a caravan and um, uh, to put a caravan on the back without a chassis. Well, this just didn't seem right to me. But John, a former engineering draftsman, took a chance and found that the console was ideal for towing the caravan on family holidays. For a mass-produced car, the console's technical sophistication made it a milestone on the road to modern motoring and a revelation to drivers at the time. Mechanically, it had got a lot of features which was really out of this world. To have independent front suspension was, well, if you'd driven the cars that, that I had ridden with, the car springs on the front, uh, then you come to independent front suspension, well, you just couldn't believe it. This came at the time uh, before the family arrived. I think really it, it holds such memories of, um, of fetching my, my son from the hospital, for instance. It's, it's unbelievable what it's done. And I was, off, I was offered £25 for it in 1972 and I said then that um, rather than sell the car I would uh, rather put the car in the garden and uh, put, put, grow some plants in it, which of course I never did. I just put it in the corner of the garage and it was really forgotten. John's car played such an important part in his life that most of its paperwork survives. The actual repair charge schedule for the console and the Zephyr 6. And when you, you read, when you read some of these, such as um, replacement of front suspension unit assembly, 11 shillings, that's just over 50p. Now, this is something which I think is very unique today. Can you imagine putting that in the back of your car today and uh, saying to people, please pass me, I'm rigging my engine. And there it is. That's the original one that I stuck in the back of the car and was proud to do it, I tell you. 
Please, Pat. With its smooth, clean, stateside looks and spacious interior, the consulate set new standards in value-for-money motoring. In America, the Detroit car giant, General Motors, was pushing motoring into the jet age. This is Firebird One. Technicians make their last-minute checks. Harley Earl gives her a final paternal pat. The father of these concept vehicles was GM's legendary chief stylist, Harley Earl, who was transfixed by aviation and rocket symbolism. Earl had seen the future, and it had fins. For her first ring around the rosy of the Proving Ground Highway. The gas turbine cars never left the test track, but their jet imagery did, and found its way onto GM's British cars. As you can see on the dash panel of this, it's even got a rocket flying across the dash there, which is a Bell X1, I think. Doesn't bear much relationship to what the car is, but it was part of the styling concept. This is not Sunset Boulevard, but Bournemouth, the home of Peter Underwood and his 1953 Vauxhall Velox. Owned by General Motors, but based in Luton, Vauxhalls, like their Ford rivals, exploited enthusiasm for American style. All the other English cars had traditional themes. They had vertical radiator grills and uh, bumpers that looked as if they weren't properly attached to the body and things like that. Uh, I think this car was styled to sell in the European countries where British manufacturers then hadn't even attempted to sell cars there before the war. Peter Underwood's enthusiasm for cars started in the garden with dinky toys when he was very young. On June the 15th, 1945, he graduated with this birthday present from Mum and Dad. His first motor. Well, pedals anyway. Later, it wouldn't be any car, but Vauxhalls that would become a lifelong passion. <laughs> 